and on the okay so you gotta hit the got it on phones it might be a little harder to... can you hear me Marty? i can that's weird because i'm on mute i know okay need okay and that you might be hearing you on the second device yeah there we go okay all right and okay okay um all right, we're looking at a few uh, connection uh, things. <laughs> uh, okay. Start us off. Okay. I think I think it's better now. In terms of we're not hearing the reverb. Okay. All right. Yay. Okay. <laughs> and you're in the same house, so I'm not sure why you're on different devices, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> welcome everybody to, um, I really appreciate this. We might have some other people coming in. Um, I, I did note the chat. Um, so we're going to go in a particular order so that we can get people on at as when they're able to get on um, before they have to go off to the, their busy lives. So uh, without further ado, I am going to um, share my screen to do a few things. Okay, let's move. There we go. All right. So welcome to Show and Tales a place to show and tailor look and listen. We have several look and listeners here. You're all as important as the story sharers are. And I um, believe that everything has a story and that everyone's welcome. So thank you so much. And a little bit, most of you know me, but I'm trying to get into a habit of this. Uh, a little bit about me. I'm a personal historian or visual artist. Also, I call myself a legacy artist whose business memories out of the box creates visual narratives from my client's photo document or and memorabilia archives. In other words, I tell stories with other people's stuff. That's the work that I do. Um, so that led me into hosting these interactive story sharing gatherings where I invite people to show an object or a photo, or for that matter, a vivid image that you have and that you carry in your mind from a day like today, September 11th. Um, and if you are an artist, creative, or a service professional looking for a unique way to market yourself that feels good and does good, reach out to me about my community of story share holders where I teach them how to host their own events as a way to build community and connection and support. So with that, a few story sharing reminders have one thing to show. Now, needless to say, Today could be a particularly difficult day to actually have a, a photo or an object from, but um, but a, a explaining the image uh, that comes into your mind is is a fine thing as well. So keep it to three to five minutes. I'm trying an, a slightly different thing today, and I am using a little gong, a little air gong to to give notifications once we're getting close to the end of the f of five minutes um number three i know that there's many of you that are artists and creatives and but we're not using this as a way to pitch or sell however i want my community to know about the work that you do so feel free to mention it and also add information in the chat because again, I'm all about building community and connection and want to support 
all of you creative people and all of you entrepreneurs out there as well. So listen kindly and carefully. Um, no like interruption during. We can hopefully have a little time at the end that you can reach out to people and uh, be, be mindful of boundaries. Uh, needless to say, sometimes these events have led to be very, can be very emotional and we can share things here that we haven't really shared with a lot of people. And um, just because there's that feeling of, of connection with that person, just be mindful of um, your, you know, that if they're not your close friends, they might not be uh, open to continuing a conversation about things. So just keep those things in mind and I'm going to stop share. Don't know why, let's see, stop share, there we go. Um, and exit. Okay. All right. So let me let Tilly in and then we will begin. Okay. So thank you so much. Hi, mom. <laughs> Margot Hickey is my mother. <laughs> and she's a, my big, my big uh, cheerleader. Um, so I, um, I am aware. Hi, Tilly. Lovely, as always, to see you. Are you Zooming in from California or from Australia? I'm back in LA. Okay. All right. Yeah, it's great to see you. Good to see you. Because I was going to say, otherwise, it's really late at night or early in the morning um, in it Australia time. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, great to see you. So um, I am going to invite, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, okay. So yes, yes. So I am going to invite um, Janie to start us off, um, if you don't mind. Or you know what? This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start us off. So um, I don't have a photo or an object from uh, September 11th. Um, but what I do have is a memory um, like seared in my brain from it. So I was in, um, in Brooklyn when the towers fell and I was a high school biology teacher um, in um, at Edward R. Murrow High School out in uh, Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. And um, so basically we were directly um, east of uh, lower Manhattan. And um, I was on a break in between classes. And so I was in the lab, in the lab area where you get all your supplies and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So I went in there and they had a little teeny TV. And I was getting busy for my next class, prepping for my next class. And a couple of the students were like, oh my God, oh my God, what? you know, what just happened. And it, it was just, you know, total disbelief. Um, you know, not believe, not, not, you know, just, it, this is impossible. It just seems so impossible. And um, anyway, the, that period, but also the biggest one is all the subways had closed down. I was a good 45 minutes from home um, and there was no way of getting home. Um, and that was, that was 45 minutes on the subway. So, um, a friend who was a, a coworker of mine offered to give me a ride. And I went out, uh, with her into the parking lot, which is, I rarely ever went because I didn't have a car. And, um, and what I will never forget is that all the cars were covered um, with ash. Um, and it, it just was like a, uh, a, a day that won't, uh, won't, uh, I won't ever remember all of that and, and how the city came together afterwards and, um, the help that came in and all of those kinds of things. So it's just, it will always be with me, like I'm sure it's with 
a lot of people and it, no matter where they were um, is what I found. So, so with that, I may pass it on to, if you have time, Michelle, should I pass it on to Jamie or would you like to go next? Uh, I can go next. Okay. It's, it's literally like, usually I would show something and tell a story like show and tell from elementary school. So, yeah. and I am so grateful to you, Mich Michelle, because I have wanted you to be on one of, at one of my events for the longest time. And I've wanted to meet you the few times I've been out to Texas, but we keep on missing one another. I so know. I am so glad that I didn't give up and you didn't either. And you're here. So, uh -huh. and I am going to go ahead and spotlight you and you can take it away and i love your background by the way oh thank you okay um and i don't have anything either that was weird i almost canceled because i actually lived in new york i was in midtown um i worked at um, a johnson and johnson pharmaceutical company we were having our regional sales meetings in a hotel and one of the managers we were on break one of the managers came into the room and said an airplane flew into one of the towers. We were like, what? And all of a sudden, every and the hotel had everyone going to a ballroom. And I can remember the I can remember seeing the television um, where they were showing people jumping out the window. So all of that is that they don't show you don't see that anymore but because it was happening right then and i was in the city and we remember seeing it because i can remember everybody in the ballroom's hand going up and um and the 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 feeling and the emotion and people were trying to call you couldn't get through on cell phones um uh landlines were busy uh everything shut down i had just moved to and bought my house in long island that july um, and there, so there was no, there was no uh, LIRR to get back, uh, Long Island Railroad. Um, my cousin still lived in Harlem where I had left before. So I finally got through to her. Well, I just started walking. I started walking in her direction because I had a key to her house and she had a key to mine and we were first cousins. So I just started walking her directions, finally got through to her and I ended up going there and staying the night. But all I remembered was after that, all I kept thinking was, I, kind of, I wanted to move out of New York. Like, it just made me really aware that I was on this island and that if anything ever happened again, like there's only one, there's so few ways to get out of, and especially you're on Long Island, there's so few ways to find safety or shelter or whatever, but it was just one of those. And I remember walking and seeing people with soot on them eventually walking past me because they were walking uptown as well. Yeah. Um, it was it was just like, it was unbelievable. It, it just didn't seem like, you know, like it, we were in the United States that it shouldn't happen to us. And in light of everything that's happening around the world, I think sometimes that's why as a country, we, we you know, just my takeaway is that we, we were been so sheltered for so long, things like this not to happen to us. Right. Um, but it just made it changed the way I thought about life and the impact that I wanted to make with my life and why I'm a speaker now and why I do what I do. I really um, wanted to uh, make more impact in the world than just make money. So that was one of the things that became vitally important to me after that one leaving New York is how I ended up in Texas um, and two, how to make my life matter. I was a part of a women's ministry. And the one thing I did find, cause I don't have anything, I don't have anything that's 9-11 related, but the first thing I remember making, making was this, right? So I have this, this thing is like almost 20, it's like really, really, oh, 18 years, but it has, it's a little vase. Um, the first year I was in the leadership in that women's ministry, the leader asked me to make gifts to give away to all the women that were coming. And this was the gift I made. Oh. 
Uh -huh. Right. Um, and so I gave me one for every woman and I kept one and I have one of those little, you know how you have documents in that tube. Yep. So it has a tube in the um, garage that I keep. So everywhere I move, this little flower with a butterfly on it goes everywhere with me. Uh, um, and that's the one thing I remember because after that decision, I immediately, I went back, I was in Long Island. Someone introduced me to the leader. I became a part of that. I was part of that women's ministry for 11 years. And it really changed the way I thought about life and being valuable and leaving everyone better off for having met me and just, um, but that was one of those moments in life that changed what life meant to me. Yeah. And, and I am so always, well, first of all, I did not know you lived in New York then. Um, and, um, and you, I love the fact you're talk about resilience and always finding that way to, yeah. It's, it's just, it's just amazing your resilience. Cause I first met Michelle through a friend of mine who'd moved from New York to Austin, Texas and, um, and had met uh, Michelle cause she was entering into kind of a van life was, was yeah. got herself a van and was packed, you know, like, you know and I love the fact that that little flower that vase and that flower no matter where you go, it still moves with you. I can even see it in the van, the camper van, um, you know, if if need be. But that's how we first connected. And I think that your path has has not, you know, you didn't continue on that path per se, but you just continue on a path of making yes. impact. And that's yes. what matters. The only reason I'm not in a van is because I'm I live with my sister. I'm a full-time live-in aide and I share caregiving. Uh, for my older, my disabled sister with my parents who are eight minutes away. So I relocated to help with that. Otherwise I was headed, you know, I stopped being in a van because she needed me in Austin. Then we relocated her back to Dallas with our parents. And then I was uh, traveling, getting ready to do the van thing again. Nine, um, uh, COVID happened. And then post COVID, I'm like getting things together. <laughs> They called me and I'm here. So I just kind of go, I tell people, everything I own can fit in the smallest storage unit in any place and I could do laps around it. And I just go wherever, you know, God, universe, divine Buddha, Allah, the source, whatever you want to call your higher power, wherever I am called, I can go. And I actually love going somewhere where it's going to be a challenge because I believe that's when we find what we're made of, when we face the fear and the difficulty and the obstacles and the setbacks and the naysayers and credit. When you step into that, that's when you actually, your superpowers emerge. Yes. And you keep on stepping into it. So All the time. I, I love that. So please, 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 Michelle, be, by all means, it put into the chat any information that you'd like people to uh, know about you um and uh and and um and you've got some love in the chat already um so uh thank you for for being our first up and i know that you you had mentioned that you may not be able I can, to yeah so i'm gonna but. till 3 30 and then i'm gonna jump off but I'm, i want to hang out and hear all the other stories because awesome. you know they're always inspiring like this is what life I, is yeah but. thank you so much i'm so thank glad you, you i'm so glad i finally made it <laughs> me too and that you didn't let the i don't have a thing <laughs> interfere with it so uh, yeah yeah that's, that's kind of like my new thing to like to step into that you know what you're always ready like i have this rule now like you know what if god universe loves me and never sets me up to fail never sets me up to look bad then i must always be ready right so <laughs> what's that mindset and in a hundred percent of the time when i step into the unknown and uncertainty with that mindset it always turns out right wow and well, well we're grateful that you 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 kicked us off and it was such a pleasure enjoy for however long you're able to stay and um and so i was wondering um i love that i know how about jamie you're up can are you okay. fine about being up i'm i'm up okay all right 
There he is. So there I am. There I you feel, are. <laughs> I feel like I am the guest at the party who shows up and didn't realize it was a costume party. <laughs> Um, I did not realize that this was 911 themed. I was already booked on another storytelling show later today. Oh, and it has nothing, and it has nothing. And I remember when I was booked that I noted it was 911, but the storytelling show that I'm doing later today has nothing to do with 911. So then Marty's invitation came in, and I didn't even think about the date, and I didn't even think when the email. So here's my so and it has nothing to do with 911. And uh, but I do have a nine one one story that I am going to tell. Um, okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I've always thought of this as a skyscraper. Yes. And it was a huge part of my childhood. It's called a one way puzzle. And um, oh, as yeah. in there, there's only one way once you take these pieces out to make it all the pieces out to make it into a square. Anyway, my aunt, my great aunt Stella Bell. Gladys and Walter, who didn't have children and all lived together in the house in their parents' house. And they lit in the in this naughty pine. See the naughty pine up there? Well, they had a den with naughty pine like that. And so they had a few toys for the nieces, the grand nieces and nephews to play with. And this was my favorite one. And after they died, the house was vacant. And then the house was pretty much destroyed by a tree, a huge tree falling on it during a hurricane. And I remember going through the ruins with my father. And I hadn't thought about this in years and I pulled this out and I almost wept because it was such a huge part of my childhood. Yeah. Um, and, and it, it, and it made me think of now of, you know, about pulling out of the ruins and the wreckage of the world trade tower, all the, you know, the stuff that people found. Yeah. Um, and it sits up on a high shelf, like a little skyscraper, but <laughs> so I was, I had, anybody freezing too more on that story but i really do want to share new york i've lived in new york city for 32 years and i then partner now husband michael is an architect and we both worked in midtown which is about six miles seven miles from uh from from where the world trade towers were so you know far and we lived on the upper west side and that day my michael had been out of work for several days with a bad back and it was his first day going back to work. And he and I were both in Midtown about 10 blocks from each other. And so his back was still a little sensitive. So we, um... Oh no, he's freezing. Jamie, yeah. you're freezing. I don't know what's oh, am I? happening. Can you hear me now? Yep. I'm sorry. What? Uh, where do I need to start off or start back to? Uh, something uh, where m your husband's back is was uh, getting better, but it was still bad. Right, and and so we didn't. He didn't. He wasn't ready to take the subway, so we took a taxi, and he uh, dropped me off at my office, and then the taxi took him on to work. And when I walked into the office, people were crowded around a TV in the conference room. And they said, you know, a plane has has hit the one of the World Trade Towers. And we I stood around and watched them. And, you know, at that point, we didn't know what was going on. And then I walked to my office after what I think maybe the second one then hit. And then I walked to my office and the phone rang and it was my mother in Texas. Jamie, are you OK? Are you all right? Are you? I said, no. I said, oh, yes, I'm fine. I'm you know, I'm nowhere near there. And my mother, I, if anyone could get through, she could. And that was the last call that came through that day. No one else got through and I couldn't get out. And Michael had a, a client that uh, whose offices were right, who looked at the uh, face of the World Trade Tower. Uh -huh. And he had a standing meeting um, on that day of the week. But he, because of his back and because he was out, he sent a colleague to that meeting so he didn't go and the colleague was not hurt but saw the whole thing and was one of those people who walked back um covered in gray ash and and then i um you know uh, you know after staying in the office for a while and watching it and then i just walked home like so many other people did and you know and just walked on mask with people and i remember people crowding around taxis listening to the radio to the latest updates and then I got home and watched everything on TV, like most of the world. And I didn't know anyone, thankfully. Um, 
in the World uh, Trade Tower. So, um, so I, and you know, and people would, uh, and I stayed in New York, and Michael and I didn't didn't have like Michelle have that feeling of of wanting to leave, like a lot of people did, and I under I totally understand that. And someone I worked with was one of those people, um, and she, and she left New York, but I always kind of felt like. Um, you know, when people would ask, oh my God, you were there, you know, how was it? How are you? And I said, I kind of feel like the rest of the world because I, because I didn't, I was, I didn't see it with that immediacy like Michelle did and other people did. And I didn't know anyone that died there. And so I just had the, what everyone else felt. I mean, I, it was, you know, horrible, but I didn't have that, um, that um, hands-on, you know, uh, uh, you know, awful connection to it like that. So a few months later, um, Michael and I, there were, it was a renter's market, you know, a lot of people had left. And, and so we started looking, we were like, oh, we've been on the Upper West Side a long time, let's look downtown. And then there's some great deals in, in Wall Street. And so we were looking at different apartments there. And like the third one we saw was a large apartment and it was a good, good rent deal. And it had um, outdoor space and we already had a place with outdoor space. So we really wanted that. And we're like, this apartment's great. And the, and the guy said, well, wait till you see the terrace. And it was this huge terrace, almost as big as the apartment, an L-shaped terrace. And we're like looking and looking. I'm like, why would these people give this up? And then we looked and we saw their view. And it was the view, a direct view of the World Trade Towers. And I was like, oh, no wonder they gave it up. And we didn't take it. No. And that's my story. Wow. It's, it's interesting. Um, yeah, that you're, you know, I had friends down, I didn't lose anyone, uh, you know, close, you know, super close to me. But I had uh, friends who work there, but uh, for some reason, I had a doctor's appointment or ha were at a meeting. Mm -hmm. or something you know similar luck, yeah by said. the luck of the door right yeah and yeah and and they still are dealing with survivor guilt um so it's uh yeah it's and and i think that the thing that happened for me was um a sense of how the city came together afterwards you know yeah that big sense of of pulling together, we're in it together. Um, you know, uh, that sense of, you know, just, you know, no sense of community and, community and fellowship and, and support. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely. Def I definitely felt that too. Yeah. So I didn't have that feeling of wanting to leave. Um, but I certainly know my mother was trying to reach me, uh, <laughs> and other friends were trying to reach me. You know, and of course they couldn't, I mean, for quite a while. Yeah. Um, so um, that was, you know, really scary for, for them because they could Right, and it was before know. Facebook where you could mark yourself as safe. You right. Know, and have that, so. Exactly, there was yeah. no way to, you know, to, to do that. So anyway, thank you very much. And, and I love, I always love your objects. I <laughs> love your objects. You always have, I remember you bringing to the, our coming out show and tales and you've been a great supporter of mine. I really appreciate it, Jamie. You came oh, thanks for the, having me, Marty. The coming out show and tales and brought a, a matchbook of, was it your parents or? Oh, that's right. My parents. Yeah. Parents. Jean and Paul, from their wedding. Yeah, yes. Had, you still had that away. matchbook that they gave away as a gift. I, I just... I, you know, well, and, and Jamie has shows and books and all that. And please feel free to put that in the chat. As I will. Well. I'll put it in the chat. And I will be following up with an email with, with his, and, and obviously there's a lot of in, in his shows that I've been, had the pleasure of going to, there's a lot of sentimentality to it. There's lots of beautiful uh photos and film and all kinds of wonderful things so we're kindred spirits for sure so Absolutely. thank you thank Thanks, you Marty. so much thank you all right. can't wait uh, to hear more stories i know i know all right so um if i don't get a message in the chat i'm just going to go with the next person who had signed up and i think that that was stephanie stephanie got back to me when I sent out the first email 
about uh, 9-11 stories. So I am going to bring her up to stage. It's so wonderful to see you. It's nice to see you too. Marty. Yeah, it was so wonderful. I had the, the pleasure of visiting Stephanie when I was out in California. She lives in a fabulous a little little teeny teeny town called rough and ready california yeah. <laughs> and i got the pleasure of of being in uh, uh parking my little brooklyn who you see behind me um in stephanie's driveway and i actually stayed for a couple of nights which was such a release relief to not be on the road for a little while and to in your little sanctuary so thank you thank you so much oh you're so welcome yes it's really fun to have you and it's fun to be here finally i'm kind of like uh, michelle but finally i made it i i did one in person back what like six years ago so yes yes anyway i, can't believe it. I know years. Yeah. <laughs> time flies yeah. take it away so i have never lived in new york um, I was born in the Midwest, and I um, I have a very different September 11th story. So my dad worked for the Lutheran Church as I was growing up, and when you work for uh, he was a teacher, he wasn't a pastor, but his um, part of when you work for the church, you were called to go to a new position somewhere. Now, we were living at the time in a little dinky town in Illinois called Paris, Illinois. Don't recommend it. Uh, <laughs> and um, his uh, contract with this school there, this church, was ending and he wanted to, he, he was looking for a new position. And he asked us, and I was, we were all little kids. He asked us if we wanted to go to New York City or San Mateo, California. And we're all like, oh, you know, California sounds good. Let's go there, right? Oh, and I think we had one other choice of Duluth, Minnesota. <laughs> so it was pretty extreme. And um, we packed up the, my parents packed up the house, you know, I mean, this was 1969. And we um, had a, and I don't have a picture either. I so apologize because I looked through, I know there's pictures out there of our caravan. We had a U-Haul truck with towing a car and a, an old Pontiac station wagon, probably in 1967. And it was piled like a camel on the back. And the seats fell, uh, laid down and my brother and sister and I were the youngest and my, I have an older brother, but he was part of the driving team. And so the three little kids laid in the back of the station wagon across the country. And we stopped in various places at the time because we were um, originally from Kansas City. So we stopped in Kansas City. We stopped in Denver to see my grandparents and Utah and all the way across getting to California. So the last day of travel, we went, we were, had started in, in Nevada and then drove across the Sierra Nevada mountains. And I remember going over Donner Summit, which is a big deal if you know anything about the gold rush. And then we came across the San Mateo Bridge which crosses San Francisco Bay, and it was September 11th and 1969. And my mother remembered that day forever, ever. It was always an, an anniversary of, we, we've been in California 10 years, 12 years, whatever. So as of today, I've been in California for 53 years. And that's my September 11th story. Um, very different. I apologize in some ways because it isn't as, you know, I, I understand how reverent this day is now, as opposed to just a memory. Right. Um, and on the actual September 11th, 20, 2001, I was way up in the mountains 
completely isolated, no television. I didn't see the actual footage of anything for days. Um, my daughter was camping. My mom called frantic, looking for us, worried. And she, she was like, go get her, go get you, go get my daughter. Cause she's, you know, this is scary. I'm like, mom, she's got to be in the safest place on the planet, <laughs> high up in the mountains somewhere camping. So, uh, but the thing that I remember the most about September 11th, 2001 was the um, way people treated each other afterwards, even out here in California, you could feel just even by driving, people were kinder. They weren't, there wasn't the road rage. People were nicer to each other. There was a, a, a com communal feeling of taking care of each other. And it was very, it was wonderful. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree. I, I, you know, needless to say, I was in New York, but I, that sense of taking care, that sen sense of, not being in such a rush yeah. all the time. Um, yeah. But it's interesting that you say, you know, about the, you know, it was, it was a significant memory for your mom, right? The September 11th, you yeah. know, so it's kind of interesting. It's like how those, how numbers, you know, I, I'm not a numeral, number, numerologist. Mm -hmm. I don't know a lot about that, but September 11th, I think, you know, it's, it's significant. And it was significant when your family moved yeah. uh, to California, and then it's significant now. So there's, you know, it's a significant date. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. I'd love to anyway. see the, the, the photos of the, the when you get a chance when you come, I will, them, please, I will please let me know. I, I know there, I only have a few boxes of old photos anymore, but I looked through all of them and I couldn't find it. So I must have tucked it somewhere, but somewhere <laughs> safe somewhere safe that I can't find right now. <laughs> and, and I met Stephanie through a, a, a women's, well, it wasn't really women, but business, a business uh, event, a conference many years ago um, in the Poconos, I think. Yes. And, um, and we, uh, we just connected and she's a wonderful artist and, um, and uh, healer in her own way. So, um, you know, you are a healer and I've been grateful to have an object that uh, she created uh, s specifically for me. And so feel, please feel free to add that to the chat. And okay. again, I will be uh, gathering everything and sending all this wonderful information about all you beautiful people. And thank you for, for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, Marty. Yeah, always. And Craig, I will bring you up. And uh, yay. So, hey, so yeah. thank you so much. It's uh, such a pleasure. I had Craig on, actually, I, uh, we did a little, a little bit of this on our, um, on my brand new podcast uh, called Things That Matter with Marty McNabb. And Craig was my third guest on that. And uh, if you haven't, I haven't reached out to you yet. I'm trying to set up systems um, <laughs> to make it easier to manage things. And you will be hearing from me, all of you, um, to share your story on Things That Matter. But um, Craig and I met through a, um, a wonderful group, uh, a mastermind, so to speak, and, um, and we've just hit it off because we have a lot in common. We're doing very, a lot of similar work, which I think all of us are doing, is this healing work in the world. And so I'm grateful to have you take it away. Thanks, Marty. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, when I tried to come up with an object, I just looked around my house and there was one, one of two objects in my house that directly linked me to that day. And um, it's a, it's a fridge magnet of all things, <laughs> <laughs> which I made. Um, Cause you know, most people know me as a musician and a composer and I was back then, but I had a, a graphic design and printing business oh. and printed fridge magnets. Oh no idea yeah 
So I remember the day vividly. I, so everybody, I'm in Vancouver, Canada. So I'm on the like the exact opposite side of um, the continent. But uh, I, I remember I, I must have driven to work without turning the radio on. I didn't have a clue what was going on. But I came in the back of the office, which takes you into the printing area, and there was no one in there. We have all these magnets that we're supposed to be printing. And I was, what's going on? And then I hear voices in the, uh, in the office area where we do all the graphic design, and everybody's huddled around the computers with their jaws dropping at looking at these horrific, um, you know, videos of, you know, the planes crashing into the buildings and the whole bit. And I don't know what it is about memories. There's like these little, little images that get forever frozen in your mind. Sometimes there doesn't seem any reason for it, but the one for me is Luke Wojcik, who was one of my printers, not a very good employee, <laughs> but just him staring at the computer that is forever frozen in my mind. I don't know why. Um, Needless to say, we didn't get much work done that day. Um, you know, we would wander off and try to do things and we'd come back and watch. So we kind of wrote the day off even though we had a lot to do. Um, but the only other thing I'll say that this has brought up for me is that, you know, today I'm all about creating ways for people to feel that they belong and to connect people and I do it with music. But even back then, this is my mom's family. It's a family magnet. So it lists all the birth dates of everybody in my mom's family, all her siblings and in-laws. And at the time I was already doing that back then. And at that time, two people on this magnet were, had passed, my, my grandfather and my grandmother. And as I looked at this today, I realized 10 of them have passed. Oh. So it was just kind of interesting that the theme was past and present. Yeah. And it's really brought that all up for me, you know, because I, I look at this magnet all the time. Yeah. Wow. Even back yes. then, I was trying to find ways to have people feel like they belonged and they were connected family yeah. magnets. <laughs> right? By, through magnets, anything can be used, right? Yeah. I mean, that's the reality, anything can be used to build connections and community and feel part of something. So um, yeah, it's neat that you you saw that even when you were making magnets, this yeah. is ultimately what you were doing, you know? Yeah. And I love the idea of magnets, you know? It's like the attracting and, you know, it's wonderful. Yeah, the only other thing I remember about it too is the music. You know, I, I remember Renee Fleming singing in New York. Yes. And, you know, all the, the outpouring of music yeah. around the event is very memorable as well. Yeah. Yeah. Another way of healing. All yeah. these ways of healing. Well, thank you so much. Really appreciate that. And, and with that, I think that it music and dance. Kristen, will, will you go next? Um, Marty, I think, can you come back to me? I'm in my studio and there's an alarm going off. Oh, think, absolutely. Is it, does that work for you if you come back? It should absolutely. stop in the next five minutes. So Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Just heard it. Thank of you. Of course, of course. No problem. Okay. So let's see. I know we have just some look and listeners uh, right now um here but i think i don't know if uh tilly might want to could could be kind of a spur of the moment uh story share until Kristen can come on yeah i'm happy to for sure so um, i was in australia when 9 11 happened and i was being a student teacher at my old high school doing the very last bit of my college education as a school teacher and uh, so I was staying back on the farm with my parents and we had no television. We'd never, ever had television and, uh, and no internet and just no connectivity at all. So 9-11 had happened, uh, if I've got my time differences right, it had happened like as we were sleeping. 
the night before. And so I showed up to school with my dad, who was also a teacher. We'd driven there together. And uh, and life was completely normal to us because we'd been in this, like, cushion of the farm with no connectivity at all. And uh, and then we just arrived at St. Patrick's and everything seemed like it would never be the same again, but we couldn't work out why. And it was just this really odd hour or so, I guess, of form class in the mornings, you know, where you take role and check in on the kids and get ready for the day and slowly piecing together what the kids and the other teachers had had at least a few hours to reconcile, you know, like that time over breakfast and getting to school. And so they'd all kind of started to figure out what was happening. Although, I mean, as I'm sure we all felt, it was so strange that you couldn't even work out what was happening if you were watching it in real time I mean it was like beyond anybody's comprehension the horror of it and so it was a day of trying to act normal and be like an anchor for these kids but in every break we would slip into the the staff room where again there was like a little television set up and and we would just grab these glimpses of footage that was you know so horrific and so shocking and um and that realization that you know the ease of travel, which is so characteristically Australian, um, wouldn't be the same anymore. And um, and yeah, the world felt like a, an even smaller place in a sense because we were also intimately connected through through footage to what had happened, but also felt like such a distant place because travel had become something that was, you know, almost impossible. And uh, and I always wonder, like, for those kids that I was teaching, I wonder how different their lives turned out because of that day. You know, they were, like, ranging in age from 13 to 18. And, uh, and so they were making big life choices about, you know, whether they might get out of this small town and whether they might travel and what might be in store for them. And I'm sure that that day was, you know, a a turning point in their little minds in terms of what would happen next so I don't have an object to remember it oh. um it was very very much a sort of like ephemeral experience just through that television that we had set up in the staff room to try and keep in touch with what was going on yeah um but yeah a day that's absolutely inscribed in memory I wonder why it is that um New Yorkers came together so strongly after that tragedy and we we kind of haven't maybe in the same way seen that after COVID if we are indeed after COVID I don't know if it's post COVID yet but I just I I came to thinking as I listened um to other stories what was it about that that didn't exist in the COVID crisis that really cohered us yeah and I wonder if we could find it and um and do a little more cohering Mm-hmm. Yeah. That. well I'll say this though we couldn't really hold you know we couldn't see each other for a long time so that probably affected that yeah we weren't able to react that way because we were isolated it had to be yeah yeah absolutely yeah for such a long time and Marty, I, it's so good to be one of it, at one of your events it's been the longest time I and, know uh, lovely and, as ever and I am so excited well one of the things I wanted to say as far as I think that The thing is, is that I do have, I have friends who still live in New York City and they did end up doing the, the every evening at seven o'clock at, you know, out the windows, you know, there's a book that a a friend of mine is actually in, um, you know, you know, that they were, you know, honoring all the first responders and last responders and all of that. And so the city did pull together in in a way we just didn't see it as much and I wasn't there. So I didn't feel it. But I think there was that. So but I, I agree with the more, more cohesiveness and what can what we can do to bring things people together. And I think that that's ultimately what all of our work is about. Like Craig, I off put some uh, information in the chat about his work, healing work with music. Um, you, um, I'm so excited to hear that you're going back to some live story time for the 
apocalypse as well, which was your response to the COVID pandemic as well. Um, and you have a podcast and, you know, all of that and creating these spaces for people to connect and build relationships and friendships and stuff. So I love that. I, and I, and please put that in the, the, the chat as well. And one last thing I'm going to be reaching out because I want to know, I was just, I just used this today. Oops. So this bag from uh, on the breakfast club from the breakfast club because i was out um, in la and got a chance to go to the la breakfast club um with uh with tilly and experience that which is a really 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 like historic you know uh club and I was using this bag and I thought, where do you get these bags made? Cause I want some, <laughs> I need to have mine made. So I'm going to reach out to you about that, Tilly. <laughs> Absolutely. I will take that as homework and I'll find out the manufacturer. <laughs> or connect me and with the anybody, right person. Yeah, I will do. Absolutely. If anybody is in or near Los Angeles, you are so welcome to come to the LA Breakfast Club for 97 years. We've been meeting on Wednesday mornings for breakfast and to celebrate friendship. And uh, it was so fun to share it with Marty yeah. earlier this year. Yeah, and one of the place. first show and tales that she joined me on, because I connected with her, her through Let's Reimagine, um, uh, end of life. Uh, there's an artist on there that's doing connective healing work as well. Kato Stewart, I think is her last name. And mm -hmm. she connected me with Tilly. And the first thing that Tilly brought was a button from the LA Breakfast Club. So I was like, when I was out there, I was going to make it happen. And we were able to make it happen. So I'm so grateful. So thank you so much. So um, Kristen, are, it, is the alarm done? No, it's still going. The, the fire company is here. It's really, I, I don't take it lightly, the irony that there's literally like, <laughs> I, I, I not, not to minimize, you know, I mean, this is a very serious subject. I'm like, really? There's, I mean, thankfully, this is not, there's no fire or anything, but I know that the fire department has to actually come in and shut it off. Oh. So I hear them. Yes. I'm just waiting. Okay. All right. Um, I just no, don't want no, it to uh -huh. be. I don't know if you can all hear that in the background. Yeah, you can, but it's you not can. really loud. It's not really it's not loud. Really loud, but okay. I I have a feeling that uh, perhaps Cheryl um, or my mother have a, a night. No, my mom's like <laughs> frantically <laughs> shaking her head. No, um, but <laughs> Cheryl, um, do you do you have a nine eleven story that you yeah. would like to share? I missed the memo about signing up, so I didn't oh. sign up. Oh. But I mean, who doesn't have memories of me? <laughs> right? um, mine is so layered. Um, okay. I went to pick up my closest friend to take her with me to, of all places, a therapy appointment. I had left my job my daughter had gotten married and and you know moved out my other daughter had gone to college and moved out and i had a real terrible identity crisis and um empty nest problem yeah. so i was seeing a therapist and my friend was older than me and she was losing her vision very badly. And I suggested that she see my therapist. So I picked her up, she got in the car and she said, oh, Cheryl, what is this world coming to? And I said, um, I, I don't know. And I still remember the beautiful blue sky with white puffy clouds as I was sitting there in my car waiting for her to get in. And she said, well, you've heard the news, right? And I said, no, and she told me. And 
I thought, oh, you know, it's today's crisis um, among many in in our experience. I it didn't like completely absorb it. So we got to my therapist's office and he and his wife were there and they had just heard the news and they had a little TV and we sat there during our hours for therapy watching what was going on with them. And I had a cell phone back then, but it was pretty unreliable. Mm -hmm. And it was really surprising to me when it rang. And it was my daughter who was at university in Toronto. Now we're in Pittsburgh. And she had heard about the plane that crashed near Pittsburgh. Yeah. Um, initially, I guess she hadn't heard the town, um, and it was a town about an hour away from me. Um, so we were able to establish that I was safe. I had already spoken to my other daughter. She was safe. Um, my husband was safe. And dropped my friend off. And eventually talked to my daughter in Canada, who described to me walking into a classroom in a quote, foreign country mm -hmm. uh, where people were talking about what happened in America. And she said some of the conversation was less than comforting. Mm -hmm. um, so she was really having a hard time with it, you know, for a lot of different reasons. Sure. And we had a family friend her age who had lived with us, or a little older than her, who had lived with us for a while. So they were close, almost like sisters. And she lived in Toronto at that point. So the two of them got together and she told this tale of how they walked through the streets of Toronto trying to find a church. Neither one of them is, you know, terribly religious but they wanted a church and I could just picture them. Mm -hmm. You know, I loved them both so much, just pulling on church doors and they were all locked. Mm -hmm. But I was really, really happy that she had Mimi who's yeah. six years older than her, who was, you know, a comfort to her. Um, and then in further discussion, we talked about, we got to get you home. We can't go through a crisis like this without being together yeah. as a family. There's another layer. Other daughter worked in Pittsburgh, immediately headed to our house. And her new husband wanted to know why was she coming to our house? Mm -hmm. And she said, well, my family wants to be together. And he thought that was kind of odd. His family didn't do that kind of thing. But he did come <laughs> over too. Yeah. <laughs> and then we heard, I mean, we were talking about, should we get in the car and go get her? Should we get her a plane ticket? Little did we know the borders closed, planes weren't flying. And it was a really odd feeling to know that I didn't have access to my baby. Um, but, you know, she dealt and we dealt and it was kind of like all I needed after oh there was also my nephew was arrested and it was horrible everything was happening um so the last thing I think I'll contribute is that my friend Anne the one that you know I picked up for this appointment um she had very, very little vision left, and she had just been taught to use a cane. She walked from her house about four blocks from her house with her cane. She went to this little gift shop, and she bought a Swarovski pin for her and for me. It was in the shape of a heart but it had um, like the design of the flag 
within the heart, yeah. um, red, white, and blue. And she brought it to me and she said, you know, we'll always be connected by this. Mm -hmm. And we were. Um, yeah. She is, she had suffered many more traumas over the years and she died about five years ago. Oh. We still have the pin, which I can't put my hands on right this minute. Oh, I'd love but, to see that. Thanks. Yeah. yeah, it was so sweet of her. Yeah. Um, and just Beautiful. to have, you know, to have been able to share that day with so many people that I loved. I was blessed to not be alone somewhere, blessed to not be in New York City. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, thank you. We attended a couple. Uh, non-denominational religious services afterward and eventually I pulled out of the deep despair that I was in yeah. and the last thing I'll mention is I put it in the chat that my friend Lily Leonardi was an FBI agent here in Pittsburgh and she was sent to Shanksville just an hour away in her own car um, just to make some sense out of what was going on. Wow. And she has written a book about that and it's called wow. In the Shadow of a Badge. And wow. she's become an angel whisperer. And um, she, Marty, she spoke at one of the Get Set Up events. Oh, cool. Um, about her experience. It's very interesting. The FBI didn't really care to keep her yeah. Um, because FBI agents aren't supposed to have visions of a band of angels yeah. <laughs> over a hillside where they well, such. Yeah, well, and that's where what Cheryl said, that's where we met was uh, Get Set Up. Um, it's uh, a great organization for um, all kinds of classes and workshops and uh, m you know, social interactions for people 55 and older. So um, do uh, check that <laughs> Nobody out. Nobody here fits that category. Marty. Send, send, <laughs> send people to it if you know anyone who might want that. So I've tried to get my mom to get involved, but may not, maybe, maybe not now. But anyway, I, I hear from Kristen that the uh, alarm is done, and so uh, we can now have her finish us finish our 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 story up because I I do think that everybody else has gone, or they're saying that they don't they just are here to look and listen. So, Kristen, thanks for giving me a chance, Mark. Oh, you're welcome, Cheryl. Thank you. And um and so uh, we have Kristen, who I also met. Uh, with in the same program as I'm in with Craig. And so Craig is the musician and uh, Kristen is the dancer and choreographer. And it's just so wonderful um, hanging out with all these creative souls that are doing wonderful work. So take it away, Kristen. Thank you. Thank you, Marty. Um, so um, I, um, wanted to share for um, my object. This is a little greeting card. I don't know if you can see it well with the zoom resolution, um, but it says sending a smile to help you pick up your day. And it has a little cat, um, presumably in a mirror. Um, and I kept this, this greeting card. Wow, more emotional than I thought. Um, <laughs> I received just a couple days um, after September 11th. Uh, I live in Hoboken, New Jersey, which is across the Hudson River directly from, from Midtown and downtown Manhattan. Um, and I was working in Midtown, um, right very close to Rockefeller Center. Uh, Marty mentioned I'm a dance artist. Uh, I've been a choreographer and a professional performer for most of, actually all of my adult life here in, in New York City. And I live in Hoboken so that I can commute into New York. Um, for my work. So at the time of September 11th, um, I was working part-time for a financial um, management company um, as my day job, so to speak. And this card, um, my grandmother sent to me, um, it's really the only 
physical reminder I keep of that time. She sent it to me about two or uh, maybe like three or four days after September 11th in the mail um, because uh, as her only granddaughter, um, my father is also an only child. So really I'm an only, only. Um, she sent this to me because even though we did have phone communication, um, while that was all unfolding, um, this was really her way of checking in. I love you. I'm excited that you're pursuing your dreams and I still worry about you every single day. Um, and um, what I, I think, I mean, I, it's been said so beautifully already by so many of you that, um, you know, there are those crystallized memories, these images of the unfolding, um, myself included, walking with roves of people through Midtown, um, for myself in my case, walking with a group of people just as far west as we could to the Hudson until we found ferry boats that were just going to New Jersey. We didn't even know where or ask, we just got on them. Um, and I was really lucky that I happened to end up just a mile or two north of where I live so that I could walk home from there. I was on the boat with other people that were going far further out than that and had no idea what they were gonna do once they got to New Jersey, but they were gonna figure it out. Um, and I remember being on the ferry and the placidness of the water in contrast to actually seeing almost like a scene in a movie, um, the, the debris, the smoldering debris that we were gradually moving further and further away from. Um, and again, the disbelief. Um, I remember the smell. Um, I remember the other thing, which I didn't remember until today, the sharing that I was in preparation for my first self-produced dance concert. And the rehearsal studio where we were rehearsing was in Tribeca. It was literally six blocks from the World Trade Center. And I remember being in communication with all of my dancers because our concert was scheduled to the premiere two weeks after September 11th. And we had been working on this piece for almost a year. And I remember talking to the studio owner who had been displaced, like everyone else downtown had no idea what was gonna happen. And um, being in this space of, we don't know and we're gonna figure it out. Um, and the, the silver lining to all of that as there were so many during that time was getting a call from her early, early in the morning, I think a week and a half later that they were back and that we could continue. Um, and one of the most therapeutic things was going back into the studio with the dancers and making the conscious choice that we were gonna use our art to help people to heal. Mm -hmm. That in whatever small way, mm -hmm. minimize the tragedy, but that was part of what we could contribute to the larger healing for humanity. And that's really a lot of what I do is, as a dance artist, I'm really a healing artist as well. So um, I kept this all this time. I will probably never get rid of it. Um, I don't know what will happen after I pass. I don't have children. <laughs> but um, for as long as I'm around, I keep this as a structural reminder that my grandmother, she's always with me. Um, and it was pretty miraculous, some of the silver linings that came out of that day and that period of time. Yeah. So thank you for giving me your uh, listening. Oh, well, thank you so much, Kristen. I, that uh, was a beautiful uh, way to wrap wrap things up. Um, it's just such a, um, you know, moving story. And, and I love these things like what uh, Mich Michelle, Michelle has her little vase that she takes around with her everywhere. And, and Kristen, you in that, that card and, you know, just uh, these special, you know, objects that we, we hold on to the, so, and please, when you, uh, Stephanie, when you find that, uh, uh, you know, photograph or a couple of photographs, please, please let me know. I'd love to see them. And Cheryl, if you find the, the little uh, crystal um, that, that is, uh, it made me remember I had gotten a safety pin that had beads 
the, the beads were on that was like a, a American flag. So, um, um, but you know, that's also the beauty of New York City. It was, uh, I mean, uh, needless to say, I'm sure you heard in, in the news and everything that there were, um, uh, you know, bias attacks and things like that. Um, there are those everywhere, but I, I still felt like New York City felt, you know, it was just very much a, you know, as it always is a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religion um, uh, place where, you know, uh, and small communities that gathered together and helped one another through, through it, through all the, through all the emotions that we felt. And uh, I appreciate um, and I think that, I think that it appears that we are wrapped up a little ahead of time, which is, uh, which happens occasionally, not always. <laughs> so as some of you have been on ones that went for two hours, but I do try to keep them to an hour and a half because I know that all of you are busy with your lives and your family and your creative work. And I just wanted to thank you so much for joining me today and I encourage you to if you want to get a hold of things quickly then to save your chat uh, which you can do by opening the chat up and then at the very uh, right side there's a couple of uh, dots three dots and if you press on that you can end up saving the chat so, but I will be uh, saving the chat for all of us, but it may take me a bit of time to get that off in an email to all of you. So, um, and speaking of which, if you're not signed up for my e email list, I'd, I'd love for you to do that. Um, and so just send me a message and um, I will uh, send you information on how to because I don't have it set up on my website, la la la. You know, <laughs> we're all dancing as fast as we can, um, and I appreciate all the dancing, and I appreciate you, the look and listeners as well, Louise and Heather and my mom Margot. I really, really, we we need to have you in the audience as well. And thank you, thank you, and enjoy the rest of your day, everybody. Thanks, okay, Marty. take right. care. Thanks, it was a pleasure. Thanks, Hope everybody. to see you all soon somewhere. Wonderful. Thank, Thank, you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Marty. Thank you. We'll see you soon. Okay. All right. Bye. Thanks again. Thank you, Heather. Bye.